Hey guys, Brandon with Flying Miata back for another FM Live. Today we're going to talk about engine cooling theory. So that is how the system works, what overheating is, how to identify overheating, and how to improve it uh, so that hopefully you don't have overheating. So as always, if you have questions, drop them in the comments and we will get to them as soon as we can. So the first question is, why don't you want to overheat? I mean, seems obvious. Everybody knows that you don't want to overheat your engine, but why? Well, it, it's kind of a progression. So initially, uh, you you know, the, the ECU is going to pull some timing out to kind of save it from you, uh, which is going to decrease your power. It can get to the point where it's going to detonate a little more. From there, it's going to move to kind of minor failures, if you will. Uh, if your oil is too hot, the seals can fail, uh, that type of thing. And from there, it's gonna to move to more catastrophic stuff, warping and basically engine failure overall if you, if you push it far enough. So what is too hot? Um, generally speaking, if your coolant is 230 degrees Fahrenheit, 110 Celsius, um, then it's, it's time to do something. You need to pull out of it, you need to turn the heater on, you need to turn the air conditioning off, whatever, to try to decrease that heat load. Um, for the oil, it's going to be 280 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 140 Celsius. And at that point, you're, if you're using high quality synthetic oil, such as our red line, uh, then the oil is totally fine. Uh, it doesn't really care about that temperature, but your seals do care about that temperature. So they're going to start to fail. And again, once you progress beyond that, uh, surface hardness of the metals in your engine can, can degrade, can fail and, and create longer term issues. So uh so how do you know if you're overheating so uh believe it or not the water temp gauge the water temp gauges are much maligned the stock ones um, and not necessarily for a bad reason because they have a giant dead spot in the middle it basically says you're warming up if you're in this range you're at the ideal operating temperature if you're in this range, which actually accounts for a fairly large range of temperature, and then you're overheating if you're over here. So the stock temp gauge is bad because it doesn't really give you real time, a real time specific number. It's not really that catastrophic because it does say you're okay, you're not okay. Um, what you kind of want to pay attention to there is that if you're not too hot, but you're beyond the middle, then you're in the not okay area and you need to try to pay attention to it or you need to try to fix that problem basically. Um, the other thing with coolant is, uh, is leaks. Um, basically it's gonna be boiling over. So your radiator cap uh, is, has a specific pressure that it will hold. And if there's more pressure than that in the system, uh, then the spring will release here and it's gonna go into your overflow bottle. And then from there, it's gonna come out into the ground or onto the ground. So uh, now that could be a false positive because if you have a really old cap that's no longer holding the pressure that it should, uh, it could be boiling over, but it's not actually overheating and it's not actually a systemic problem, a big problem, you just have to replace your cap. Caps are not very expensive. They're a good thing to do. Um, so <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's kind of the rundown there. So let's talk about theory real quick and what a cooling system is. So your engine is basically a giant heater. Um, it, it puts rotation out the back, which is what spins the wheels, but a lot of the energy that goes into the engine comes out of the engine as heat, just it's hot. So you have your heat generator here. What you need to do is get all that heat into the coolant and then you need to take that heat in the coolant and transfer it to your heat exchanger. And then you need to take that heat from the coolant to the atmosphere. So gather the heat, transport the heat, shed the heat is the theory there. So what can we do to improve that? So you always wanna start at the beginning. Um, is your radiator, well, you always want to start at the beginning. Do you actually have a problem? Because your friend has a shiny radiator uh, and maybe he needs it, 
doesn't necessarily mean that you also need that because the he's doing track days and you're just a streetcar or maybe kind of sort of vice versa um all of the upgrades that we sell most of them all of them all of them um aren't going to hurt anything they may or may not actually be required for your situation so job number one do you actually have a problem to solve um, is your problem, my engine bay is boring and I want a shiny aluminum radiator. Well, awesome. Then that's a really easy problem to define and also solve. Uh, but if we're, if we're looking at functionality, do you have a problem? If you do have a problem, then start with the easy stuff. Is your radiator cap holding pressure? Um, you can easily test it or you can just toss a new one on there to, to double check. Um, if possible, I would recommend testing it just to be sure that if it boils over again, you know that, okay, it is actually overheating. It is actually boiling over. It's not that I just got a second radiator cap that was bad. Um, the, uh, you also wanna check your coolant mix. So water actually transfers heat better than antifreeze does. So if you're very heavy on your antifreeze mix, then that means that it's going to transfer heat worse and again that also that means sucking the heat out of the engine and also shedding that heat to the atmosphere so more water is better with a giant asterisk on it you want to make sure that you have enough antifreeze for freezing protection of course uh, but also for lubrication and corrosion protection so what we generally like to do is 70 percent distilled water don't use tap uh, and then 30% antifreeze. And that's a pretty good, like for most, that's still for Texas, something like zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it, it still goes way down for your freezing protection, but if you're way, way north, then maybe that's not quite enough. Um, you want to make sure that you don't have leaks. You know, if you're bleeding coolant off, then your coolant level can drop, uh, which means that there's less mass of coolant to absorb that heat, there's less mass of coolant in here to shed that heat, that type of thing. Um, one thing to pay attention to, you can do a pressure test, uh, which is good, because that will show you all those uh, parts. One thing, if you still have a stock radiator, um, this one, dirty as it is, is actually still in decent shape because it's, it's pretty black. If this plastic is brown or green, you need to replace it before you have a catastrophic failure. Um, also, if you have like kind of white crusty, stuff along here at the junction between your plastic tank and your aluminum core, uh, that's an indication that you've got a coolant leak right there. Uh, so replace it. Um, and then are, do you have good airflow? Um, is there a tumbleweed in your grill that you didn't realize you sucked up and now there's no air coming in there? Are you driving in the winter and your car is overheating and it doesn't make any sense and it's super weird because it's the winter and it's cold, but the mouth of your car is packed in with snow and you have zero airflow through your heat exchangers. That's a really easy way to overheat in a kind of contradictory, confusing way. Um, also, is your radiator in decent shape in terms of the fins? Um, this one's actually not that bad, but like this kind of thing, if it was bad all the way across or if it was just filled with stuff, that's gonna, gonna impede the airflow through the heat exchanger, through the radiator, and the lower your airflow, the lower your heat exchange. You're exchanging heat between the coolant in the radiator and the atmosphere, so the more prone you're gonna to be to overheating. Um, that also applies to the air conditioning condenser. Now, that, so if, if the air conditioning condenser is, the fins are in terrible shape, that's not going to affect it's gonna affect the radiator secondarily, I guess. Basically, it's the same thing as blocking the mouth of the car because the air that's trying to pass through the condenser and then through the radiator can't, excuse me, can't flow through the condenser because the fins are damaged and therefore it cannot flow through the radiator, which means that you're gonna overheat from airflow. So those can be a little bit harder to figure out. So, um, we're gonna go back to theory and we're gonna kind of take that one by one and how can we improve that? So how can we improve putting heat into, from the engine into the coolant? Again, your radiator, or excuse me, your coolant mix is a good one for that. 
Uh, the one thing to bear in mind with the coolant mix is your cap. So water boils at a lower temperature than uh, an antifreeze mix does. So if you're running straight water and water wetter, which we would only recommend in the most extreme conditions, um, then you need a higher pressure cap. If you're running a 70-30 mix, maybe you need a little bit higher, but our 16 PSI cap is probably gonna be the best bet for you. 20 PSI is okay, unless your cooling system is slightly borderline and it would be okay at 18 PSI, but it's not okay at 20 PSI. So now a 20 PSI cap that you didn't need because you're running uh, a normal mix and you're not overheating has caused an issue because the pressure's too high. So basically we have them. Um, this is our 20 PSI cap, silicone seals and all that fun stuff. Um, we also have a 16 PSI cap, which is gonna be more appropriate for most people. So the other, the, one of the big things in terms of transferring heat to the coolant from the engine to the coolant is our reroute. So on a stock setup, the coolant comes in from the radiator here, it goes into the engine and then it comes right back out uh, the front of the engine here. So there is a little bit of flow on the back here through the heater core, um, but that's basically it. Also that flow comes out, um, you have to take my word for it, we don't have that part on here right now, but comes out of the, um, comes out of the back of the head and goes right back into this pipe, which goes into your water pump inlet, which goes back into the engine. So no cooling happens back here. There is some flow through the heater core, but no cooling happens here. So what our reroute does is it makes it so that the coolant, again, comes in at the front, goes through the engine past all four cylinders, and goes out of the back into the radiator. Couple notes there. The stock temp sensor is in the back of the head. So even when you don't have quite as much flow here, um, assuming the back of the head is gonna be the hottest, your gauges, both dash and ECU, are going to read the hottest situation there. So it's not even, which isn't ideal, but you are at least being told what the worst case is. The other thing is, uh, one of the kind of neat things with our radio, or excuse me, our reroute, is this hose here, which is normally not connected to itself. Um, we use this engine for testing, so apologies for its grossness. Um, so what happens with a turbo car normally is the coolant comes out of the back of the head, gets much, much hotter in the turbo because the turbo is very hot, and then it goes back into the water pump inlet. So it goes back into the engine without being cooled off. With our reroute setup, it comes out of the back of the head, so you take hot water, you make it much hotter, and then it actually goes into this port, which goes into the upper radiator hose, which goes to the radiator, which means that we shed that heat in our heat exchanger instead of putting that heat right back into the engine. So that is transporting the heat, if you will, to a place where it can shed that heat as opposed to right back into the engine. So once the, um, once the heat is, has been taken out of the engine and has been transported, you want to shed it as well as possible. So that is exactly what your radiator is for. So the radiator is kind of the first part of the equation. Um, a stock radiator is what we call an upright or a downflow radiator. So the coolant comes in here, goes through the tubes here, and then goes out the bottom. So you can see it's, it's in the core for this distance here. With our crossflow radiator, which we did a lot of testing on many, many, many years ago, um, you can tell that it's in the core much longer. So it's the whole way across, it's shedding all of that heat. So it's, it's far more effective for shedding heat. There's also other details. The tube and fin count is really high. Um, it's thick enough to have as much surface area as possible, but not so thick that it actually impedes airflow and the delta, the difference between the incoming air and the coolant or the radiator temperature is not very high by the time you get to the back of a thick radiator. 
So you lose a lot of heat here and you lose less heat here. And if your radiator is super thick, you lose less heat all the way back. Super thick radiators are great for coolant mass and for it taking a long time to get that coolant up to temperature. So they can lengthen the amount of time it takes to overheat, but they often won't uh, actually decrease and maybe this is exaggerating a bit, but basically once you're in a steady state, everything is up to temperature. It can't shed the heat as efficiently. So step number one is a good radiator. Step number two is airflow. So your stock radiator has fans, at least one on it. Um, the more airflow you can have across your cool core, across your radiator, the better. And there are different ways to achieve that. Uh, if you have a track only car with just a radiator, you, your radiator is fully sealed in, you've got really nice and intelligently designed uh, ducting on the back to suck the air out and your car is never stationary, sweet, maybe you don't need a fan. Um, if your car is stationary, then you need a fan. If your car does not have a ton of ducting on it, then you need fans. Um, a really good example of this is Formula One. If you guys watch Formula One, they don't have fans, which is great because they are insanely aerodynamically engineered. So there's a ton of airflow when they're moving, but what happens as soon as that car is stationary, everybody descends on it with fans to make sure that there's air moving through all those heat exchangers so they don't overheat. So the need for fans and the need and the, the size of the fan and all that kind of stuff is gonna be dictated by your purposes, your, your use. So in order to maximize the airflow, uh, we have a number of air, airflow kits is what we call them, fan kits. Because we're, we're assuming that, you know, this is, maybe it's a street car. Maybe it has some ducting, but not a ton. Maybe it doesn't have hood vents to help suck the air out. Um, maybe it's stationary sometimes, that kind of thing. So the a big fan can make a big difference. Um, the shroud ensures that all the air that the fan pulls uh, actually comes through the heat exchanger as opposed to coming in around the sides. Uh, these flaps make it so that when the air coming into the mouth of the car is greater than what the fan is currently pulling, then the air will flow right through. No big deal, these flaps just flap open. Uh, as soon as it's not and the fan is pulling more, they get sucked shut and now all, again, maybe not all, but a very high percentage of what the fan is pulling comes through the core. You wanna be careful with your fans. There are a number of fans on the market that look cool, they've got an aluminum shroud, they you know, say racy things, they pull huge numbers of CFM of air. Um, if that number is not accompanied by a pressure, by a chart that equates pressure to flow, light it on fire and throw it away. <laughs> it, that, that number is literally measured in a room under vacuum where the fan is pulling against literally nothing, so it is not a real world situation. These fans, all of our fans, regardless of the price point, have big motors that pull a lot of air against high pressure. Now, the more money you spend, the more uh, flow it's going to have, especially as the pressure stacks up. And what pressure stacks up means is you've got your radiator and then you have your condenser and then you have your intercooler and then maybe you have an oil cooler or whatever and you wanna be careful about stacking too many things. But the point is, once you have that stacked up, all of those things add resistance to the flow of the air. So you wanna make sure that your fan actually has enough guts to pull through that. Um, I either get a good fan kit that you know is good and has numbers behind it or stick with the stock fans. Don't get a shiny fan setup that says, it flows this much air, but it doesn't actually say anything about the pressure that it's pulling against because you're probably shooting yourself in the foot with that. Uh, okay, and then uh, oil cooling. So oil is frankly less of an issue for most cars. Um, for turbo cars, particularly turbo track cars, it can be much more of an issue. Um, oil, again, has a much higher threshold, 280 degrees Fahrenheit, 140 Celsius, thereabouts. So what I, what I tell people is if you think you need an oil cooler, 
I would verify that you need an oil cooler first. I would put a temp gauge on it and I would see what those temps are. And if they're in the you know, 260, 280 range, that's probably a good idea. Um, if they're in the 220 range, 230, 240, 250, you're fine. Um, assuming that's the highest you see under you know, your, whatever your version of, is of extreme circumstances. You know, if it's strictly a street car, maybe you're looking at a mountain run. Um, if it's a track car, you know, it's when you are on track at a lower speed, more full throttle, uh, very hot day, very low um, humidity kind of day, that is gonna be your worst case scenario. If you do an oil cooler, I would strongly recommend a thermostat. Now, if it's a track car that is always driven at 10 tenths, you don't need a thermostat, that's fine. If it's a track and street car, if it's a street car, I would strongly recommend a thermostat. Um, really, your oil should be up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit before you start beating on the car, because that, that way everything is up to a proper operating temperature, the oil is a little bit thinner, the oil can flow better, that type of thing. If you have a thermostat on a car that maybe doesn't need an oil cooler at all or doesn't need it in that situation, uh, then your oil is too cold and you're actually doing more damage than you are good with the oil thermostat. Generally speaking, I wouldn't do an oil cooler unless you know you need one. Um, again, maybe a turbo street car, uh, almost definitely a turbo track car. If it's a dedicated track car, there's a decent likelihood, naturally aspirated dedicated track car, there's a decent likelihood, but I would put a gauge on it, make sure. you know. Again, start at the beginning, what do you actually need? So this is a longer one and I'm not done yet, but uh, that is basically my spiel. So I'm gonna go through the questions here. Uh, I have a handful of them that we got ahead of time. Talk a little more about hood vents first. You just kind of... Yeah, so um, we can go back to hood vents. So hood vents are basically an airflow thing. So hood vents can help evacuate the air from the engine bay. And actually I will talk about that briefly. So, is there enough light over here? Can we go to a car that we didn't plan ahead for? <laughs> so you want airflow. Again, airflow is the most important thing. So what you want is high pressure here and low pressure here. So that's gonna, air is gonna move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So that's why things like the splash pan are important. You wanna leave that on because otherwise you're gonna increase the pressure back here which means that the air is gonna be less likely to flow through the heat exchangers. That's also why you wanna be intelligent about what you do. Um, not to pick on anybody. Turn signal intakes, I don't, I mean, for one, it's not a huge amount of air, but for, for another, you don't wanna cool this. That's, that's actually not the goal. You wanna cool this. You wanna cool your heat exchanger, your radiator. If you're just dumping cold air onto the engine, actually all you're doing is increasing the pressure back here and decreasing the effectiveness of the actual system that's cooling off your car. So turn signal intakes if they just dump into the, into the engine bay. If your car's not overheating and you like the way they look, rad, leave it, that's fine. Um, but they're not doing you any favors in terms of cooling. Um, at least on a Miata, if you bump up the back of the hood here for cooling airflow, well, that's a high pressure zone which is why uh, our old Randall intake works so well. But that's a high pressure zone, which means that once you get over a certain speed, you're actually forcing air into the engine bay, which is decreasing the effectiveness, decreasing your airflow and decreasing your effectiveness of your heat exchanger. So you wanna be intelligent about that. Um, same thing, so hood, hood louvers, hood vents are very effective, but you wanna make sure that they're located appropriately. If you put them in an area of high pressure on the top of the hood, and Theoretically, you should be looking at the pressure underneath and above realistically. We just look at the pressure above. Um, but if you're looking, if you put your hood vent in a high pressure area, same thing as what I just said, you're dumping air into the engine bay, uh, which is decreasing the effectiveness of your heat exchanger. That said, if you put them in a low pressure area, then they are going to help evacuate air out of the engine bay, which is gonna promote airflow past the radiator, through the radiator, and is gonna help improve that cooling. And that's kind of where I was going with the, with the ducting versus the fan thing. 
if your car is extremely well ducted, no air conditioning, not really driven on the street, um, then cool. You probably don't need much of a fan. Uh, if your car is more of a street car, full body, that kind of thing, then you do need that fan to basically compensate for the fact that there is high pressure back here, even with a stock car. And it's, it's, yeah, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but it works. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers that. Thank you for that prompt there. Clearly I did have much more to say. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm going to go through the questions here, uh, the ahead of time questions, and then we will check in to see if we have any live questions. So on a stock ECU, at what temps, uh, air temp and coolant temp, does the ECU pull spark? Uh, I don't actually know. Uh, I can tell you that on our old Hydra standalone ECU, which probably has uh, similar numbers, it starts to pull uh, spark or ignition timing uh, at 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius for intake temps uh, and 212 Fahrenheit, 100 degrees C for coolant temps. So that goes back to the, that's the point at which it starts to pull the power back to save you from, excuse me, save the engine from yourself, I suppose we could say. Um, is intake air temp or coolant temp more important? That's a good question. Um, I think in terms of power, it's, I mean, for one, they kind of go a little bit hand in hand. I think for power, it's going to be air temp uh, for longevity of the engine it's going to be coolant temp. Okay, my Mazda Speed with a Mishimoto ra radiator, 19 PSI cap, shrouds, and hood vents still gets over 212 degrees on track. What else do you recommend? So 212 isn't really overheating. Um, 212 is, as I just said, at the point where it's starting to pull back spark. So you, you're probably going to lose a little bit of power. I don't think it's the kind that's enough that you're actually going to feel it but technically you're making slightly less power there. So you're not hurting the car. So do you need to worry about that? Mm, I don't know. Um, so what I didn't hear in here is coolant mix. Are you running 50-50? If you are, uh, then I would pull that back to something like a 70-30. Um, is your 19 PSI cap still holding 19 PSI? Uh, with shrouds and hood vents, you may still see a benefit with a good fan kit. Um, this is our stage two fan, so this is brushless, soft start, whatever. This isn't the point that I'm, I didn't bring this out to sell fans, but also I'll sell a fan. Um, I've got this on my personal car and it is phenomenal. Very, very friendly, works well, uh, but the point here is that it pulls a stupendous amount of air and it only pulls that much air when it's actually needed because the, the fan speed and therefore what the fan pulls is directly related to your coolant temp. So a fan might actually be helpful there. Um, but again, I wouldn't be too freaked out about it. You're losing a little bit of power. Uh, you're not damaging anything at that temperature. I want to install, this is, this is one we get a lot. Um, I want to install an oil cooler while keeping my remote oil filter kit intact. Do I just link the oil cooler into the output line, then run the oil cooler output back to the engine intake? Yes, as long as you do not have a thermostat, which I would strongly recommend against for a street car. So the short version there is treat them as if the other one didn't exist. You have one setup that goes from the engine to your remote oil filter. You have a totally separate setup that is not plumbed through that goes from the engine and the oil thermostat to the cooler. They'll work totally fine that way. You don't have to worry about starving the engine of oil because you routed them all through. And when your thermostat is closed, now you don't have oil flow. Whoops, a daisy, there goes your engine. So yeah, treat them as two totally separate things. Okay, what about deleting the thermostat? Um, no, I would not. Uh, so there are arguments that the thermostat basically keeps enough pressure in the head to help keep boiling, particularly spot boiling down to a minimum um, or eliminate it altogether, ideally. Uh, so I would, not, I would not take away the thermostat. Um, also, how hard are you driving the car? What are the conditions? So on and so forth. For a street car, that is a terrible idea um, because just like your oil, you want your engine 
less the coolant, but you want the engine to come up to temperature. And if the coolant is over cooling it, uh, because there's no thermostat, it's never going to come up to temp. So what you can do and what we typically do is we'll run a 180 degree thermostat Fahrenheit uh, instead of the stock 195, which basically gives you a little more headroom on that. It's kind of the same argument as the thick radiator. Over a long enough period of time, it's not going to make any difference for 180 versus 195, but it's going to give you a little bit of a head start on it, if you will. Okay. When is a reroute kit really warranted? So this, this kind of goes back to what I was saying. Um, none of the stuff that we sell is actually going to be detrimental in a specific situation. And we could come up with some really specific situations, but whatever. Generally speaking, none of it's going to be bad. You can put a reroute on a bone stock car that has zero issues overheating and it'll work great. Do you need it? No, it's fine. Um, is it going to hurt anything? Also no. So if you have a turbo car, I really like the hour reroute specifically because it dumps that hot coolant back into the radiator. Um, and we did, you, there's videos on that that you can watch, but the short version is that's a lot of heat that the, that the uh, turbo puts back into the engine. Um, so if your car has a turbo, I would strongly recommend it. Um, if it's a track car, I would, like to see it on there. Uh, it is going to keep the coolant temps more consistent, which is really a good thing on any car. But again, all of your sensors are on the back of the head. So your sensors are already telling you what the worst case is. So it's not going to tell you that the back of the head is so much hotter than the front of the head, which is going to be the case to some extent anyway, because it's still going to flow through there. Um, but it is going to keep them closer to the same. So kind of a non-answer. Um, if you're having issues with overheating, basically here, I'll put it this way. My progression uh, for fixing cooling issues is mix, cap, assuming maintenance is good, leaks and all that kind of thing. Mix, cap, radiator, fans, reroute. That's what I recommend for generally to generalize. That's what I like for progression there. Do NB2s even need a reroute due to the head gasket change? Another popular question. Uh, yes, with everything that I just said about cars that need reroutes. So NB2s need them a little less because of the specific head gasket change. Um, it's still a good thing. And it's still something that I would recommend if the situation dictates, as I mentioned before. Um, and very logical follow-up, if I have a reroute on an NB2, do I need to change the head gasket to an NB1 to get any benefit? No, you do not. You will still see a benefit by putting a reroute on an NB2, NB2 head with an NB2 gasket. I will say that if you are pulling the head gasket for some other reason, I would not do it specifically for this, but if you happen to have the head off, I would do an NB1 or you know an earlier head gasket uh, just because, uh, but I would not change, I would not go through all that headache just to change the head gasket just because I did a reroute. You'll be totally fine. That car is an NB2. It's had a reroute for five years. I don't know, long time. Um, and that's totally fine. Okay. <clears throat> Will removing the AC condenser between the radiator and the intercooler help cooling on a forced induction car? Absolutely. So that goes back to airflow. So even if you have a brand new, perfect fin condenser, it's still blocking airflow to your heat exchanger. So it's still hurting the airflow through the heat exchanger. The other part of that equation is that when your air conditioning is on, it's basically doing the same thing as your cooling system. It is dumping heat into the atmosphere. More specifically for engine cooling, it is preheating the air that goes through the radiator, which means that the delta, again, the difference between your coolant temp and your air temp, and the bigger that difference, the more heat it's going to be able to shed. Well, that's a different, excuse me, that's a smaller difference now. So your radiator is going to be able to shed less heat because the air conditioning condenser is putting heat into that air. It's preheating the air that goes through the radiator. So yes, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, 
What can you do to solve it? Well, taking it out will certainly do it. But a big burly fan that pulls a ton of air through there can very much help that. And again, that goes back to what I was saying about resistance and pressure. So if you have a fan with a big enough motor to pull against all that pressure, it will pull through that stack up of heat exchangers uh, and will maybe solve the problem and let you keep your air conditioning. Uh, again, I've got this car, this one on my car and my AC is actually quite a bit cooler uh, with the big burly fan on it because of all that airflow. Okay, why do you really need a coolant reroute? I kind of feel like I've covered that at this point. Um, so, and this video is already long, so I'm just gonna skip that one. Uh, we do have a full video on YouTube about that. So if you want more details on the reroute, including the development of it, how it works, all that kind of stuff, we've got a few different videos on that. Recommended oil viscosity or weight for higher, hotter climates. Um, so, is your oil actually overheating? That's the first question. If the answer is no, then I'd probably stick pretty close to the stock spec. Um, if you find the oil pressure is very low, and NAs and NBs run pretty low oil pressure to start off with, um, so, but if you find that it's low, then yeah, you can bump it up a little bit. I would not make a huge change. I would kind of go one step up. You know, I go from 1030 to 1040, uh, that kind of thing. What is the first thing you'd add for cooling to your street-oriented ND? Uh, well, the first thing I would ask is, do you have a problem? I mean, I'd love to sell you a radiator, but unless you're going for underhood bling, are you actually overheating right now? Do you actually have a problem? If you do have a problem, it's the same progression as everybody else. Is your cap good? What is your coolant mix? Do you have any leaks? Um, then I would do the radiator. Uh, the ND actually has a brushless fan to start off with. The ND, I'm pretty sure, has bypass flaps on it, different ones, uh, to start off with from the factory. So can we improve on it? Sure, it's already pretty good. So um, again, I'm a broken record at this point, but start at the beginning. Do you actually have a problem to solve? Or what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Again, underhood bling, sweet. We'll sell you an aluminum radiator that is better than the stock one, but unless you're overheating, you don't actually need it. So not to convince you to not spend money on parts. That just means you need to buy a turbo, which means that now you do need a radiator. So there you go. Um, okay, and then yeah, NC cooling tips, same thing. Uh, can I cook hot dogs on my exhaust manifold? Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very hot. Uh, so particularly if it's turbo manifold, so I would keep a very close eye on it because they're probably gonna cook really quickly. Also, uh, that might've been tongue in cheek, but they actually have grills for snowmobile exhaust. So you can cook your meal as you're riding and then you stop, pop it open and you've got a hot hamburger, sausage, whatever to eat. So um, maybe not as tongue in cheek as was anticipated or not. Okay, here's a long one that I'm gonna paraphrase a bit. I have a stock ND2 uh, that I track. I am not going to increase the powertrain level. Uh, I oh, Would installing coolers for the oil transmission and di differential be advisable or just overkill? Um, should I just keep using high quality lubricants, Redline specifically, so excellent. Uh, that are changed regularly or opt for the active cooling. I have also seen passive air scoops to route air around the transmission as a simpler mean of dissip dissipation. So, there goes my record again. Do you have a problem to solve? Um, now with the ND2s, they are more sensitive to that kind of, or excuse me, with the NDs in general, they're a little more sensitive to that. Uh, and it's, it's also gonna go to how hard you drive the car on track. So really my answer is gauges. Put gauges on it, see what your temperatures run. Um, there's a decent chance that you'll be fine with oil temp um, I would probably be tempted to do the transmission and the oil cooler. Um, the passive scoops can probably help. Uh, I have not dug into those a bunch. As long as they do actually route air to the um, transmission or differential, whichever one it is, um, transmission, then yes, same argument. More airflow equals more cooling. That's, you know, aluminum is, is good at... Um, heat transfer, uh, there's a lot of surface area there, all that kind of stuff. Um, I would be 
curious, and I'm not saying it, they're, they're bad. I, I would just be curious to see what the string test does. You know, put string on there so you can see what the air is doing. If it's kind of doing this, then it's just turbulent and it's not really making any difference. If it's stuck to the surface, then it's sucking the air in there, uh, or, or that is indicating that that's where the air is going. Um, so that would be a, a really interesting experiment with those. Oh, hopefully that was done on the front end, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, make sure you have a problem to solve first. For an ND, you probably do for, uh, for trans and diff, um, maybe for oil. But again, thermostats, which our kits have um, in thermostatic control of the electric pump. But yeah. Okay, I need a glass of water. Uh, let's see if we have any questions live. Yes, Mike. Question about what is our favorite non-glycol based coolant? Red wine. Um, water, water. And why might you use it? Uh, so what is our favorite non-glycol coolant? Um, if you, yeah. Glycol like coolant. <laughs> uh, we just we use pretty normal coolant around here. Um, the if you are going to run straight water, uh, then Redline water wetter is a good option. Um, that doesn't have any kind of freezing protection, so bear that in mind. Um, and I personally don't have any experience with any of the waterless stuff, that kind of stuff. So I can't really speak to that one way or the other. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Honestly, normal, not expensive or complicated coolant has worked very well for me personally all the time. So uh, any more questions? None. Okay. Well, there you go. Thank you for sticking around. Um, if you have more questions afterwards, drop them in the comments. We'll try to get to them. If you have ideas for videos, let us know. If you like this, comment, like, subscribe. Uh, and we will see you next time. Thanks as always. Oh,